Today we're going to talk about how to develop JS applications using Docker containers, actually developing and debugging. Um, I'm Haik Garstian, I work at Tumo Center for Creative Technologies. I've put down full stack DevOps, but I don't actually know what my title is. Whenever someone... Hi. So yeah, when someone asks me like, what my title is, I don't really know, so that's just like something random there. Um, so today's agenda is that um, we're going to talk about what kind of problems we encounter when developing <coughs> Node.js applications um, and how Docker containers can actually help you in that respect. But also, what are Docker containers for a start? Then I'm going to uh, go through some practical examples and then some tips on how to develop yourselves and then profit at the end. <laughs> and yeah, at the end, uh, any questions you have like specific to your projects. So, First question, uh, which version of Node.js do you use? Do you know? Like, do you know which specific version you're using? Is it just like, oh, it's just 10. Yesterday I noticed they released, nope. They released uh, 11.1.0, um, but we're using uh, 10 for one of our projects, eight the other ones. So I hope you, hopefully you know. What about NPM? Are you using the like 641 or any of the six variants or five? Maybe you're using Yarn. Do you know which version of Yarn you're using? Maybe even PMP or JSPM, these are old ones. Or maybe you're using Bower because there's like a problem you can't migrate to Node.js NPM. What about your colleagues? Are you really sure they're using exactly the same versions that you are using? Because if they're not, they might cause problems. Are they even on the same OS? Sometimes you have a package that installs fine on Ubuntu or Linux variants, maybe okay on Mac, Windows maybe there's a problem. You need to install additional binaries and it's gonna cause headaches. So now that we've established that you know what version of Node you're using, and all of your colleagues are using this exactly the same version that you're using, are you sure that your dev machines are the same as what you have in production? Is it the same OS again, or are you using Mac because it's cool, but then your production machines are using Linux? What about your build tools? Like, if you've installed Gulp globally, it's not part of your package JSON. Are you sure everyone's using the same version of Gulp, or Grunt, or Webpack? Is there a way to know? But it's not all doom and gloom. If you are working on a project on your own, then it's fine if you don't even know which version you're using because it works fine. But when you start working with colleagues or even have, you have different projects on your same machine, one project might require to use Node 10, another one 8, how do you change between them? You can use MVM, you can uninstall Node.js, uninstall the other one, or use like Vagrant for virtual machines, but it's like a pretty much bigger headache. So here's a personal anecdote. Um, before we started moving to Docker containers at Tumo, we had a problem where pretty much all the developers were running on Windows, but our production machines were Ubuntu uh, 16.4, I think. So we installed Open Server. It's a pretty cool tool. We made some Russian developer. Um, and it allowed you to install uh, MongoDB, PHP, MySQL, Postgres, different tools. And it worked on Windows. But we had some problems. So it was, it was OK. It was pretty stable. But then when we had to get other developers to join in, there was a lengthy process of onboarding saying, OK, well, grab open server, install this specific version, uh, install all the plugins, go and change the configuration. So using uh, PHP 5.9, but even though on the server it's 5.9.4, it's okay. We don't have the latest version of Windows that there's like a problem. Um, change your PHP any, then they install something, doesn't work. We have to go in and start figuring out what the, what's not working on the machine. Then download Composer, install Yarn, not the very latest version, the one that's on the production machine, and a whole host of other problems. And I'm pretty sure you might have come across similar problems. Uh, another simple problem that I came across a couple of weeks ago, um, this one line of code, what could go wrong but just one line of code? The file hmm? is not no, no, it's there. So um, that's the one of code and this is the file tree. We have an editor JS and editor Vue. On Ubuntu, uh, file names are case sensitive, so editor with the capital E is a different file to editor uh, with the lowercase e. They're not the same files, but when NPM was trying to resolve the file, it turned the import e, capital E to lowercase e, and it's always importing editor.js. So then uh, we didn't have a, like a major error, but the page wouldn't display because we're using Vue.js and that HTML was gone. 
all the code was there, so we didn't have any console long errors, but the, the markup was gone, and we couldn't figure out what the problem was. Um, we had it on editor, and then we said, okay, we'll, we'll ignore it on one of the dev machines, because well, he wasn't working on that project. Then we refactored some other code, and then, whoop, that thing started not working. So I said, okay, let's see, figure out what's going wrong. And then we spent a day just like trying everything. Maybe we broke something during the refactor, and it was just basically because of this. Like a very silly problem, and it was on Mac. So on Windows, I appreciate you could have loads of problems, but on a Mac, um, they're, I think, similar in terms of case insensitivity. So what's the solution? One of the solutions is using Docker containers. I mentioned you could use the VMs, but Docker containers are slightly better. So here's a picture of a Docker containers. Everyone, when they talk about containers, they use this image. So I didn't want to rock the boat. Here's the same image. So one quote from Albert Einstein is, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So if by the end of the session, you don't understand, maybe I haven't done my job properly, so I, maybe I should get fired. Or maybe during the speech, I'll learn some stuff. And um, the process is called rubber ducking. So I don't know if you ever heard of this process where you might have a problem and you're like, you, you might spend the whole day trying to figure out what, what's wrong with my code. You call over your colleague, you start explaining what the problem is, and as soon as you start explaining what you should have built, you realize what you've built and what you should, should have built isn't the same thing. And it only happens when you try to explain it to someone. So maybe through actually talking about Docker containers, I can learn some stuff as well. So another quick story about the two-mode process. So uh, we started migrating from our monolithic application to Docker containers about a year ago. And I had it about, heard about Docker, but I never tried to use it because it seemed very complicated. Um, but then one of my colleagues, he's more like a ops side, he started setting up some Docker containers and I started jumped in. He showed me the ropes and so it's really cool. It's a shame that I didn't start uh, developing with it earlier because it actually isn't very complicated once you understand the simple stuff. Um, and yeah, so I said, okay, um, Docker container is really good when you go push stuff into production, but you can also use it to develop applications. So maybe like, for example, you have a Node.js application, it's Ubuntu, it's close to your production, you only use it to actually send your stuff to the cloud, but you can actually use that Docker container to make <coughs> your development process much easier. Um, but when we tried to do that, we realized uh, there are some documentation on how you can actually set this up. But it's, it's all over the place. There's no standard way. So we rolled our own solution. And I'm going to show you some of the code that we use. Maybe I can open source some of the parts that we use at Tumor. That image again. <laughs> so let's go over actually what Docker containers are. Um, we, and uh, after the slide, you can go into more detail because there's like loads of different configurations. I'm just going to go through like the simple stuff. So this is the problem that Docker containers are trying to, to solve. I've stolen this these slides from somewhere else because it's a pretty good explanation. You have different types of services. You have a static website, workers, front end, DB, um, analytics, and you have different types of um, <coughs> not hardware, like uh, providers. So your development machine, your actual testing server, uh, the data center, you can go to the cloud. So you have this problem <coughs> where you have this, the guy called it the matrix from hell. All your different types of services and all different types of uh, hosting environments. And it's a pretty nightmare because the, Every single thing might be running a different OS, different version. How do you know it's going to work properly? You're going to have this problem where it works on your machine, you put it to production, it stops working, you have to go and uh, SSH into the machine, figure out what the logs are saying, why did it crash, and all kinds of problems. And uh, before 1960, they had a similar problem in terms of actually shipping uh, merchandise. You had like uh, cars, food, uh, beer, all kinds of stuff, and then you had different transportation methods. And then, so uh, one example, like you have coffee, you have wine, you can't put them next to each other. They like the smells might uh, like um, mix together. So they started. Uh, you get this matrix from hell again. But all different types of merchandise, all different types of tra transportation. So then they came up with shipping containers. It's like standard box that you can put whatever you want, all cars, all coffee, all oil, and then you put it onto a ship. And all the containers are separate. They don't mix with each other, and everything's the same size. So it makes the process much much easier. So then. Um, they came up with the same concept for actual applications. So you have all your different websites, your front end, uh, your DB, you put it inside a container, and then all the different providers know how to actually run the container. And it's always the same thing. It doesn't matter if it's on the cloud, if it's on your machine, or even a Raspberry Pi. You can make like a small application, put it there, and you, you don't need to worry about that it's going to not work on your Raspberry Pi or a sm similar machine. 
And so you don't get the matrix from hell. Everything is the same. Same Docker image on all the places. <laughs> so we sort of know what containers are. Um, but how do we get one for ourselves? We can really easily make one. All you need is a Docker file. So in a Docker file, you write some instructions. And the instructions are like if you had to explain to your colleague what they would need to do to get the thing to run. So uh, this first one from node 10 Alpine, it says, uh, imagine like you take an OS. It's uh, one of the Alpine Linux, which is very small. It's about 60 megabytes in total size. And it has node 10 already installed. If you write like this, it's going to install the very latest version of 10. But you can say 10.4 or 11.2, like from yesterday's uh, machine. The next one says env. So you set the environment variables. You can set as many as you want. Uh, but you can also override them afterwards, which I can show you. Then work directory says, OK, now you have this, uh, the OS running. Uh, change like CD to the actual serve app folder. Copy package JSON and package lock JSON from our Git repository onto the root, uh, into the actual work directory. Run npm install production with silent. We don't want to like, hear all the bullshit that's happening. Sorry. Uh, and then you copy your index.js, and then you run npm start. So what happens is uh, it creates an image. Then when you run the container, it uh, it's already like everything's done, it just calls this command. And if the, the container dies, it just restarts it again with the same command. And wherever you put this, it's going to be always the same thing. So you don't have to worry about, oh, it's not going to work somewhere else. It's always going to work everywhere. Um, so yeah, uh, actually, I missed one point. So one thing that you might have noticed is there's two copy operations. There's a copy on package.json and there's a copy on index.js. So there's a, there's a reason why we've done it in these two se separate steps. It's because of this thing. So Docker containers are like ogres who are like onions with loads of different types of layers. <coughs> what happens is that um, with a Docker file, it caches every single layer it creates. So when it says from node 10, it takes one image. Then when it's, you set the environment variable, it creates another layer on top of that image. Uh, then when you do work directory, it's, it's like all separate layers stacked on top of each other. But it caches. It knows like. Um, if package JSON and package lock JSON haven't changed, it's not going to run that layer anymore. It's going to carry on from probably here because you've changed index.js. So whenever you're changing your source code, you don't want to reinstall everything all over again. You only run this step. But if you change something in package JSON, it's like, oh, well, actually, no, that's changed. Let's start carry on building from here. And uh, that means that when you create a Docker file, you have to pay attention to the instruction um, like sequences. So there's like. Uh, you can give it an environment variable. And if that's going to change all the time, you don't put it at the very beginning because that's going to cause the whole thing to run from the very beginning. You put it, um, I think I've got another slide where you put it at the end as close as possible to where you need it. So if you try and do this, everything can be pretty much fine until you uh, try and install something which is on a private Git repository. Because what's going to happen is that uh, the container, it's isolated from the host environment. So um, your Git credentials, they're not inside the container anymore. They're on the outside host machine. So when it tries to pull this, it's going to say, like, I don't have SSH key. Or you it might want a password, even though you've set it outside to work properly. But there's a way to get around it. Uh, yeah. Don't know why this is here. Uh, so in that same Docker file, we add an initial step at the beginning. You make the um, SSH directory. You change the mode. Um, you install git and open SSH client, and then you install the uh, keys for gitlab.com. And then over here, which one I was talking about, you can take your private key from outside, create that file on the inside of the container. So now when it tries to install, it's got the same keys that you had on the host machine. But the problem is there's a security hole with this. The final uh, the container you're, you're running has your keys inside. So for development, it's OK. Um, then in further, like if you read more, you can see that there's ways to have multi-step builds where you can actually delete the key, and then the final one doesn't even exist. But for development, it's fine. Uh, so then, OK, so you've created your image, and you need to run it. Uh, there are commands on the command line where you can say, OK, run this uh, container using this image, pass loads of configurations. And it's OK for like some silly uh, containers. But if you actually want to run an application, you probably want to create a Docker Compose file. And a Docker Compose file is a YAML file which describes how you want that container to run. So in this instance, uh, we have um, a volume, a named volume, which I explained what you needed to do. You give your service a name. You tell it what uh, image to use. 
Um, and then you have some cool things where it says uh, map the port 9229 on the host machine to 9229 inside the container and map uh, um, 10,000 on the host machine to 80 inside the container. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Can we make it a bigger? Uh, let's see if I can go bigger on this. Uh, no. Yeah, it's an image. Uh, no. Unfortunately, no. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, then you can remember when I had the command npm run start, you can override it with something else. So what happens is that uh, with containers, uh, you have to have a command. Otherwise, the containers are not going to start. You have to like it's like an ignition key. It has to do something. But if you do that, that means like the node process. If you want to debug, it's too late because when you turn the container on, the node is already running. So what you do is you type something like this. This isn't the only way, but it basically tells it to tell dev, dev now this is nothing, but it doesn't. It keeps the container running. So it's really good for development. Um, it says restart always. So if the container dies, just restart it as many times as you can. And then you have volumes. The f this first one basically tells um, the container map the Git repository I have here to inside the container in inside the serve app. So all the files you have on the host machine are available inside the container. But we don't want the node modules inside the container on our, on our machine because they're not useful. If it's like Ubuntu and your Windows, there's like bcrypt, loads of binaries that uh, it's not going to work on Windows. So you basically using named volumes, okay, you can say hide all of this. I don't need that part on my host machine. Uh, and then you can set invite and variables, so like the time zone, the development environment, this development, and you set debug to one. And then, uh, let's see, Docker. Hmm. Yeah, okay, so once, once your container is running, you can actually run this command, docker exec ti, and it, it allows you to shell into the actual running container. So I can probably show you one. Um, let's see, let's, let's come up the slide. Hmm. I can't go away. So uh, I've got a service running uh, for a little service we created at Tumor. So there's like a front end for students, there's a back end for administrators, and then it's just running one machine. So I've already connected to inside this container. So where it says serve app, oh, wow, wow this is really tiny. <laughs> OK, that's not going to help. Uh, let's see if we can get out of this one. Uh, let's see if I can. Damn it. Hmm. Control shift. No, it's three time you can't see it, right? Okay. That's a shame. <coughs> hmm. Okay. Well if you did this, you could actually go into inside the container and monitor what's happening. Uh, you can for example, once you're connected, you can actually install more packages and everything's done inside the container as if it was an actual VM. Um, but I think I've gone really fast over this, so it's like one of those origami videos on YouTube where the guy's like folding all different papers and then it's the really key moment where you need to actually do something it's like and you have the origami, it's like what, what's that important step? That's probably what's happened here, especially that you can't see all the commands I'm writing on the screen. Um, but once say you run that actual container, um, you could say okay, what do you do? I could have done that from outside. If I had my Node.js application, I could have just run npm start from my host machine. Why did I do that? And one of the reasons is basically, like I told you in the Docker Compose, all the files that you don't need on your host machine are inside. You can actually even uh, have all the files inside the container, none of it on the host machine. That's when you're actually running for testing and you can go in and modify stuff. But when you're actually actively developing, uh, that's not what you want to. You just want to expose the key files to the host machine. Mm. Oh, uh, here's a silly thing I created. So when you want to, um, restart one of your containers, you have to type in docker compose, give it a file name if it's not docker compose and up. Uh, I just created a silly npm package called bring sally up where you just type in bring the name of the file up and it starts uh, singing Moby song. I'm not going to it, play it though. <coughs> um, so for development purposes what we do at Tumo is uh, 
we attach one shell into the machine and run Nodemon, so it keeps the server running. And whenever one of the files changes, um, it restarts. And then we have, uh, well, usually what you can do is um, you can go into the, the source folder, run Webpack with hot module reloading. But for Tumo, like one of the applications we built, I think I could probably show you what it is. Uh, let's see. I think I can show it, right? <laughs> Maybe. <clears throat> Let's see if I can get it. Mm -hmm. Actually, probably not. Okay, but it's it's quite complicated application for editing stuff and. Uh, it has like a, an editor examiner uh, parts for students to access. So it's different. Uh, it's different source code, but using the same components within the same project. So we have to build five applications using the set like same components, but different entry points. So with Webpack, you could probably do code splitting, but it might be a problem because it's, it might not be smart enough to figure out what's happening. So we've written, written our own build controls where we rebuild the five different sources whenever one of the file changes using a rollup and it's all custom built to work properly. Uh, so one question you might have is, uh, if your container is running on a machine and everything's isolated, how do you debug? For example, with VS Code or um, with um, Chrome's DevTools, you can connect to a running node process, right? Um, by typing the same command, like node inspect with breakpoint, type in an address, and then what you want to run. If you do this from inside the container, uh, because of the, let's see, let's go back to the Docker Compose file. Oh, here it is. So in Docker Compose file, we've got, we're mapping port 9229 to 9229 inside the container. So inside the container, when you actually run the Node.js application, because that port's been mapped to the host machine, it's as if you actually ran it on your host machine. So you can uh, run it properly and you actually can debug either with VS Code by putting breakpoints or with Chrome DevTools. So it's actually not that different to running on host machine, but you've got the benefits of it running inside a container. Oh, and um, if I share the slide, this is like a recipe for VS Code. If you put this into VS Code, uh, you've, you've got a button for debugging that does everything automatically. It knows which port to attach to so you can uh, automatically connect to that machine and get, start debugging. Uh, okay. How much time do I have? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, okay, let's, so let's look at more comp... Oh, wait, uh, yeah, it's code editor so we can see it. Like a more complex example. So the application I was talking about, the multiple entry points, it's got all these different uh, applications. So the, the Docker file, let's, I think I could probably zoom this in. And can you guys see it back? No? So you've got a pretty monster Docker file here. We've got, um, we're running a node 8, as I mentioned, but we've, we're making an intermediate container called Builder. So you've got uh, production um, environment, uh, work directory, all this stuff I explained before, copy package JSON from the actual Node.js application, not the source, uh, install in production, then copy the source package JSON, which is like the more heavy stuff. Then we change the, source, the working directory to source, uh, take the private key, really close to where we need it. Um, run npm install, only the dev dependencies because we're going to build it with a rollup, so we don't need any of the production dependencies. Um, then we copy the node modules that we need from the final build, change it back to app, uh, do that. <laughs> um, some other fa fancy stuff to get like a code to work properly. Uh, and then we delete the keys at the end, so we don't need it. And then we go back and take another image again uh, and call it runtime. This is the thing we're actually going to run. 
and this, this is a really cool thing. You can say, okay, now just copy everything that was left in the previous image from serve app into this machine. So once you've cleaned up everything, you've built everything, your final image doesn't have any Git installed, it's clean. Uh, th there's like a cool um, base image for Docker called void. It's an image with nothing. Like if you run it, there's nothing inside, there's no processes. And it's really cool when you're actually developing Go applications. You can compile your application, it's just one binary. So if someone tries to hack into your machine, there's no shell, there's no Vim, there's no Emacs, there's nothing inside the container apart from the binary. With Node.js, you can't really do that, but you can delete all the stuff that you didn't need, like uh, if you had Rollup or Webpack, everything you installed, all you have is a final index.js and all the minified JS files. Uh, let's see if I can go back. So if you're really interested about how all this stuff works and you want to take it into production, there's another talk today, I think, at 3.30 with Shahan, and he's talking about how to uh, take your Docker containers and use Google's Kubernetes to actually push the stuff to production. So once you know how to use it for development, then you can actually do follow his talk. Uh, so I deliberately left some parts out so you can ask me questions. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, there's like yeah, really complicated parts that you probably need to read up online because uh, the talk will be really long to explain all the finer details. And I think reading it yourself, you'll probably learn more than me just like talking for ages. Um, so are there any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, can you just uh, run like a command with CMD, CD target, change target, so instead of one? Uh, yeah, you, uh, you can, although I don't, think it, I don't think it will have any effect because when you do copy operations, it's working on the working directory. So if you do, like, uh, um, because you have different layers, if you do uh, CD, you're just basically seeding on that layer, but the next layer doesn't have that change anymore because you ran the command, it finished. So then the only way to change the, the working directory is actually called work directory. But uh, actually, no, but uh, if, for example, if in one command you need to do stuff, you could. So you can do CD to different directory and do another command and do another command and CD back. That would work, but in the next layer, you've, you've lost that context that you changed the directory. You would need to do, uh, change the work directory if you wanted to persist it onto the next layer. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yep. Uh, can you make a short sum up of what Docker actually is to make sure we understood all the stuff correctly? Okay, so I'm probably doing that job properly with the Albert Einstein <laughs> quote. Um, so basically, the Docker containers allows you to uh, isolate your de development environment or your production environment into one small container. So then all your dependencies are inside the container. So for example, five minutes, okay. So for example, if you gave that image to someone else who had Docker, they, all they have to do is turn it on and it would work. You wouldn't have to say, okay, install this, make sure you've got this, oh, it's Windows, you have to fiddle about with these things. If you don't mess with the source code, you can just give that image to someone, they turn it on and it works. And plus, with when you go to production in the cloud, you can have like hundreds of these containers running, and every single one is the same. So a classic example with Netflix is there was something like whenever someone tries to stream a video, uh, that person gets connected to a container that's got a maximum capacity of 100 people. As soon as the 101th connects, within a few seconds, they turn another container on, and you start getting streamed from that container. So they're all, they spread across the world, and uh, even on, I think, um, for Gmail, Google actually spins up a container f for you. Like when you log into Gmail, you, you get a container running just for you. Because it's, it's so small. Um, so it just containerizes everything, makes everything reproducible and deterministic rather than failing because there's something missing and you don't really know. You have to go in and connect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. and, if there are any more questions, then you can catch me outside later. How about that? <laughs>